All right, hi everybody. Uh, I'd like to introduce Nathan Yergler, who's going to talk about in-depth PDB. Thank you. Um, my name is Nathan. I'm a principal engineer at Eventbrite, and um, today I'd like to talk to you about PDB. This talk is all about how to find and remove bugs from your software. If you're interested in adding bugs, there are other talks available. <laughs> so now is the time to, um, to perhaps check those out. Um, not that any of my fellow presenters are, anyway. Um, so <laughs> I'd like to put a couple URLs up first. Um, just to, hold one second. There we go, okay. Um, so I'm gonna be showing a bunch of examples of using PDB in a couple of different contexts. And I had got some feedback during run-throughs that they might be hard, I hope they're not hard to read. I think I've tried to adjust the fonts appropriately, but you can follow along on um, Presentatron if you, um, if you so desire. So we're here to talk about P PDB, the Python debugger. And I hope that by the end of this talk, I will have convinced you that PDB is better than using print for debugging, that PDB, <laughs> Well, um, you know, there are the tried and true staples, and uh, there's a reason, you know, it takes some energy to break out of those. That you'll know how to use PDB to explore a running program, and that you'll uh, be convinced that PDB is a useful tool to uh, understand so that you can extend it to behave in the way that's most useful for you. So what sort of things can you actually do with PDB? Uh, you can look around running code. This is an example of a program that we're going to talk about later. It's a little calculator, of course. And in this case, I've been pr I'm just looking at what a value of a variable is. But more interestingly than this, you can also look around Python's code. So if I wanted to know what os.path.join does when I actually call it, I can stop P Python's execution inside of this function. And I can do this without editing files inside of my um, system Python. And I can, in this case, discover that it's actually calling a module called POSIX path, which, who knew? I can also return to the scene of a crime. If I have a piece of code like this that creates a server, and when I actually make a call to it, it raises an exception because the address is already in use, I can actually use PDB to jump back into the program after the exception has already occurred and inspect the state as it was when the program died. So these are all things we're going to talk about. Everybody prints. Everybody uses print as a tried and true uh, debugging mechanism, but PDB is better. PDB lets you explore the state of a running program or a dead one. It lets you repeatedly run your program so you can debug it and actually get into a flow of debugging uh, as you work with a piece of software. And it lets you build the tools you need to extend it so that it's appropriate for your particular use cases. Let's start with um, a little bit of uh, PDB 101. And I uh, just want to lay a little bit of groundwork so that we're all on the same page around how to use PDB. The most common way to get into PDB is with setTrace. So setTrace is a function that tells Python, stop immediately when you get here. And you can see with the green arrow on the um, left-hand part of the code is my little Fibonacci program. There's a green arrow pointing to my, my setTrace line. And when I actually run that on the right-hand side, you'll see that Python stops before it gets to the print statement. And, that, and it gives me the PDB prompt and lets me know it's about to do this next line. So from here, um, there's a few really basic commands that I just want to cover briefly so that, we, so that we all know about them and kind of understand the difference. I can say next if I want it to execute the entire next statement. So in this case, you'll see that, um, oh yeah, if people tweet at me, it's going to buzz on my watch. So that'll be fun. Um, uh, you can see if I did next here, um, it's going to execute that entire print statement for me. So it's going to call fib with sysargv, it's going to print it out, you'll see the eight there below next, it's going to print the dash dash return, which means I've reached the end of a block, and then it's going to wait for the next command. So next executes the current line and any calls it might have to make. This is in uh, contrast to step. If I did this again and just run step, step also executes the current line, but stops as soon as it possibly can. So in this case, it's inside of that fib function. And uh, at this point now, I could actually continue to step or next and work through that. When I've figured out what I need to know, or I'm ready to continue running the program, 
there's the continue command, C-O-N-T, very cunningly named, but this leaves the debugger and lets you conti and it continues executing the, ex executing the program. So th those are sort of, when I'm working with more junior engineers, those are the three commands that we do first and we like get some mastery of because they're gonna form the basis of almost everything else we look at. So there's next, step, continue, and if you press enter, you'll repeat the previous command, except if it's list, in which case we'll talk about that. So the PDB prompt can look a little foreign. Um, I just wanna point out, it it's, it's looks foreign because it's meant for speed. Once you understand how to use it and you understand what the commands are, you can operate very, very quickly and you can very easily understand what's going on in your program. So you can always ask for help um, about any of these commands, uh, uh, except the undocumented ones, of course, and, um, and, get, and get some context. So we've looked at how to enter PDB directly uh, at a particular point. But more useful, in my experience, is actually executing code under PDB's control. And so this is what we're gonna do for the rest of the presentation, is look at how this works and then dive into some more um, ways you can extend PDB for your particular uses. PDB, like a lot of Python modules, can be executed as a script. So Python-M PDB, and then what you're actually going to run. This is gonna stop your program before it does anything. So in this case, you can see it stopped at Fibonacci.py in line one. It's at the module level, and it's getting ready to import sys. So it's done nothing at this point. You can use this even for running Django under PDB so that you can do your Django run server and set a breakpoint, which we'll talk about, or do some other sort of introspection of, of lower levels of your web app um, before your program starts. You can also do this, there's also these run and run call functions. Um, I don't use these a whole lot unless I'm maybe working in the interactive prompt, you know, trying to understand a piece of code a little better. But this lets you, I think they're pretty clear. The run with quotes basically execs a little bit of code and run call takes a callable and some arguments, executes it under PDB. And again, it stops it immediately. It's sort of interesting that when you do um, run with the quoted uh, code that it stops inside of string one module uh, as opposed to the actual thing because it hasn't actually exec it yet. So if we can run our code under PDB control, enter PDB immediately, we now have the necessary understanding to actually debug under PDB and help us uh, fix some buggy software. I should point out that this software, is, this little program is in the GitHub repo with the slides. So, so I, I wrote a, pro, a small program that of course does a post-fix notation calculator over HTTP as one is wont to do. Um, I think we're gonna you know, roll that out as part of our payment system at Eventbrite. But um, it, it's very important to support post-fix notation. And so you can do things like two one plus and get back three. You can do two ten star and get 20. Uh, 210 plus two star is naturally 24. Um, unfortunately, uh, I'm not that good at writing calculators. So it's not that great with unexpected input. So if I have something that's not an integer, for example, it blows up with a value error. So if, I'm gonna ex if I wanna debug this program using PDB, the first step is simply to run it under PDB. And you'll notice that, it, again, it stops before it does anything. It's getting ready to import the WSGI server. And if I say continue, C-O-N-T, it'll tell me that it's ready to serve on port 8000. And now I can actually use curl to make my requests and start to figure out what's going on. Keep in mind, we haven't put any set trace in here. We're just running it under PDB. So when you run it under PDB and you execute curl, it's going to, again, give you the trace back because that bug still exists. But then it's going to tell you that there was an uncaught exception and enter what's called the postmortem debugger. And this is one of my favorite PDB features. It's one of the most useful, in my opinion, because this is what lets you jump back in time to, um, to, to where your program died. I, I believe this is the core of uh, Guido's time machine. So you can see here where the exception occurred, it's now telling us that it's in the push method in pfcalc.py on line 28, and it's getting ready to um, call int value or operator. I say getting ready to call, but it's, it, I mean, it's already been called, right? The program has already died, but this is where it happened. So this is the state I want to actually inspect to figure out um, what went wrong with my program. 
And I can, there's, there's a bunch of commands I can use to sort of start inspecting state and looking around. I can print the value of something. I can look at args with the args command, which tells me uh, exactly what the arguments were to, to, to the current function or method. These are um, really useful just for kind of understanding the lay of the land. Also important, because right now all I really know is that line 28 has this int uh, value or operator, and this could potentially be code that is somebody else's or in a third party module. So I can do list. And list by default prints five lines above and below the current line, so you get a little bit of context. If you're gonna use PDB, and I think you should, uh, it behooves you to read the list documentation because it has some subtle behavior about what happens when you run list repeatedly. It, instead of repeating the exact command and showing you those lines, it starts just showing you more and more code, which can, if you're not aware of it, it can be a little disorienting. Um, and always one to uh, shell for Python 3. Python 3.2 uh, added the long list command, LL. This is pretty great. On the left-hand side, you've got the normal list, which just shows you five lines uh, above and below. On the right-hand side, you have long list. Long list is delightful. It only shows you the current method or function that's being executed. So you can see it actually gives me this information that about the conditional and about the, the declaration that I have missing in the, in the Python 2 version, and uh, also omits the def result from the end, which just kind of clutters up the display and makes so one more thing to ignore as I'm looking at um, trying to figure out what this program's doing. In the, sake, for inter in the interest of complete completeness, there is a pretty print as well. Great. Um, this does raise the interesting question as I look at this pretty print slide. How would I do division with my HTTP calculator? I don't know. Um, so <laughs> that's great that you can see what the, that these values are, but a lot of times you also have a hypothesis about what's going on. You, you think, oh yeah, I think, that, I think that this value is actually should be, you know, there should be some other expression used or, you know, you want to test something out in the context of your running code. And so PDB provides the bang or exclamation point command. And um, is it worth an aside to explain why this is important? Because I, this is something that escapes a lot of people. If I have a function called add that just takes three numbers and adds them, and I want to stop inside of here because addition is hard, and I want to inspect what's going on. So I stop inside of PDB, and now I want to see what B plus C on its own is. If I put that into PDB, it's going to give me this rather confusing message that plus C is not a function or is not on the system path. Um, that's sort of weird. I wasn't expecting that. What's going on here is that the PDB prompt is a lot like Python's REPL prompt, just not as smart. So when you have something that starts with, uh, with the same letters as a uh, PDB command, it thinks it's a command. So in this case, it thinks we're trying to set a breakpoint at the function name plus C, which we're not. If you do bang B plus C, you get the actual result you expect. I highly encourage everyone to get in the habit of using the bang operator when you're working inside a PDB. If nothing else, because if you have a variable named something like context, where the first four letters match the continue command, you won't accidentally blow away your entire debugging session and continue running the program when really all you wanted to see was that context. And again, Python 3.2 is better, uh, or 3 is better. There's an interact command, which drops you right into an interactive shell, so you don't have to remember that. So how do we actually navigate the program, though? How, so we've kind of all, we've been looking at the state where an error occurred, or where we set a breakpoint. Um, there, there's almost certainly gonna be a desire to, to see how we got into this mess and how, do we, how we got to the, to the state that we're in or what the calls were to get here. So if we have a, consider another uh, bug in my calculator, which, um, I, you know, the VP of engineering is here and I'm talking about all these bugs in my software, so I hope that, um, I hope he's, he's forgetful around uh, performance review time, but, um, <laughs> You see, if I have two, three, plus five, uh, I've got this extra operand in my, in, in my postfix notation, and uh, it's gonna raise a syntax error. It's an invalid expression for my, for my particular calculator. I'm running into PDB, so again, I'm gonna drop into the prompt right away. Um, and I can use the where command 
to figure out just what the call stack is. And I want to say, like, I've actually omitted a bunch of lines in the hopes of making this like semi-readable. Um, but the important thing to note here is that the very first line is the first call your program made to get here, and the last one on the bottom of the slide here is the actual point where the error occurred. So this is just like a trace back stack trace. Um, it shows you how you got to this particular point. And you can go up and down the stack. So if you use the, up, the cunningly named up command, you'll uh, wind up at the previous call, and you can actually inspect the, the frame there, and you go down. And any other commands you might issue are going to be actually um, executed in that context. So, this, so you can kind of see how this lets you start to build up a uh, suite of tools you're using and then apply them at different points in your program to really understand what's going on and how, you, how maybe your code interfaces with a third party code or with a framework, something like that. So I want one quick note about postmortem debugging, which is what we've been using a lot of here, where we jump back in time to this exception where it occurred. When we run um, under the PDB module, we're running with a postmortem debugger. And our server starts with these uh, you know, three, three statements. We make the server, we print some status message, and we serve forever. The postmortem debugger effectively does this. It effectively wraps that code in a try accept, a bare accept, so it catches everything, imports PDB, and then calls pdb.postmortem. So this looks an awful lot like a, uh, a set trace call where you'd import PDB, call PDB set trace, but it's, it's significantly different. I want to show you, what, show you how. Um, and I also want to note while we're here that you can use this in your own software if you have some sort of exception handler and you actually have the exception tuple from like sys.getLastX. X, uh, EXC, I think it is. Um, uh, you can actually pass that into PDB and have it jump to a particular point as opposed to just a bare exception. So if we use set trace instead of postmortem, we're not going to get it all what we want. Um, we'll, hit, we'll curl to get into the debugger. And if you'll notice, the point that we stop inside of PDB is actually the set trace call, not where the exception occurred. So at this point, that call to uh, the, cal the calculator has already been made, it has failed, it has raised an exception, and all that context is gone. So the postmortem debugger is, 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 um, is pretty honking great. So moving on to breakpoints, this is um, where we start to dive a little bit deeper into PDB. Um, breakpoints are a way to set stop points within your code without actually editing it, which I think is pretty great, especially when you're dealing with a system library or a framework. So here's an example where on the left-hand side in this slide, you're seeing the, uh, some code from our, our, post, our calculator application. This is the actual WSGI app portion of it. And on the right-hand side, you're seeing the shell interaction uh, of running it under PDB. And now instead of typing C-O-N-T to continue as soon as I enter PDB, I'm going to tell it I want to break at pfcalc.rpn app. So when you set a breakpoint, it can be either at a callable or it can be at a particular line number um, in, in, a, in a file. And this file can be located any, in any directory that's on the Python path. And you'll see that tell that PDB tells you that breakpoint number one was set, it tells you what line it was set at, and now we can go ahead and continue. So setting breakpoints is really simple. Um, it's a file and line or some function. But we're going to return to that last parameter, the condition, in a little while. So once we set our breakpoint, if we use curl to make a, another request, you can see that it's going to stop right inside of that uh, RPN app function that we talked about before it even creates the cal calculator class and before it tries to process the, the uh, um, input. We can inspect the state of things like environment path info, um, and then we can go ahead and continue and let it run, or you know, maybe we actually want to look up and down the stack for some reason. Just a little bit of additional information about breakpoints. Um, when you issue the break, break command by itself without any parameters, it'll tell you what, list all the breakpoints for you and tell you if they've been triggered. Um, the number of times triggered is usually not all that interesting to me. It ha there have been times when I've used breakpoint commands incorrectly, and I, realize, I only realize it because the, the count gets incremented, but um, I think that we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit in a, in, in a little bit. 
Uh, when you're running under PDB in the postmortem debugger, the other thing that's interesting is if you press Control C or if your program stops, it's going to automatically restart it for you, and all these breakpoints remain intact. So this is pretty handy at, if you're working on a program and uh, you're making a few changes in the in in your in your code, but you still want to break inside of the framework that calls it to actually step into it and inspect what's going on. You can make your edits. Control C, restart the program, and your breakpoints are intact, and you're ready to go again. Um, so PDB does a pretty good job of of managing of managing this information for you, so you can really focus on debugging your program. There are a few um, additional commands around breakpoints to enable them and disable them. Not uh, particularly interesting. So what about that condition clause um, in the break, in when it comes to setting breakpoints? This is sort of interesting. Um, there are times when you, are, if you're debugging a web application, for example, um, you might want to only, you know, you, know that a problem, you know a problem occurs on posts, but you don't want to break at every request because there's a whole lot of gets before you actually are able to push the button and, uh, and get the post. So you can use a breakpoint condition to, to do that sort of, get that sort of behavior. And the breakpoint condition is a Python expression that's going to be evaluated in the context of the breakpoint. And the breakpoint's only going to fire if it evaluates to something truthy. So in this case, uh, I'm going to check if environ request method is not equal to get. And it's going to tell me that it set the breakpoint. And if I type break, it'll let me know, yep, I've set the breakpoint for you. And I'm only going to stop if this condition is true. So, when you actually go to run your program, you wind up with something like this. On the left-hand side, I've got my program running. On the right-hand side, I'm going to show some curl calls. If I just make a normal request, two times three, uh, I'll simply see that it outputs the, uh, it returns the answer as six and outputs the log line. If I do two plus three, of course, it's going to do the same thing. But when I do a post with curl, it's actually going to drop me into PDB right there. And now I can see that the, the request method is post at this point. So breakpoint conditions are really, um, they make putting breakpoints at very low levels uh, palatable. They make, they make it possible to, if you're using a Django application to put it inside of the lowest level uh, request handling. Um, because if you, know, if you have an idea about what you're looking for, you can, very, you can still very narrowly target those breaks. So we've talked about how to enter PDB, how to look around your program, how to go up and down the stack, how to set breakpoints. The final thing I want to talk about um, this afternoon is how you extend PDB. And um, so there, and there's a couple of different ways uh, you go about this. Um, uh, and the first of these is aliases. When I'm in debugging a program, I use dir a lot. I, uh, if I have an object that I want to look at, I don't, you know, with Django, for example, we use Django to Eventbrite, and I'm looking at a model. I know that there's a way to get a list of all the local fields in that model, but I can never for the life of me actually remember what that method is because I never call it in my day-to-day -day work. I only seem to call it when I'm either writing some more framework code or when I'm debugging something. So I use this dr alias to um, shorthand pretty print dir some something. And this shows that you can use the, like, the percent one is going to get re replaced with any uh, with the first argument that you pass into this alias. So the way this might look is, if I just do a print on self, I'm going to get the wrapper of this class, right? But if I use dr self, it's actually going to pretty print out all of the members of this class for me. So, um, so this is sort of showing you a, few, a couple of things, showing you how to set an alias, that you can pass parameters to them. And um, th this is an example of something that I use a lot that probably doesn't belong inside of... Uh, you know, the stock behavior, but I can put it in sort of, in sort of my bag of tricks. Um, I, another one I use is uh, LOC for the locals. Um, I've got, you know, there's args, there's what, whatever in PDB by, by default, but knowing what, knowing what the state is, especially when I'm going up and down the stack, is, is particularly useful. At least, oh, and this is what it does, all it does is show the local keys. Aliases can also refer to other aliases. Um, so if I have a print and dict alias, I could alias that to PD. Well, something to note here is that my PD alias doesn't specify percent one, 
all those arguments get passed on automatically for me. So, uh, you know, I mentioned that the, the PDB interpreter is a, it, it's simplistic in how, in how it approaches parsing, and uh, as soon as it finds a match, it's going to go ahead and pass on the remainder of anything to, 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 that, to that code. And, and of course, your aliases can also call aliases. You, 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 can, do, you can start composing things. So this, is, this was a cookies uh, alias I used for a while when I was um, working with a lot of sort of classic Django views that um, I wanted to look at what, you know, if I had a request in context, what are the cookies in that request? The other way that you can um, extend PDB without actually editing the source is breakpoint commands. So these are commands that can be executed when a breakpoint is hit, and they're executed just as if you had typed them at the PDB prompt. Um, there's, you, you can give us some list of commands that can be one or 20 or however many commands you want. Basically anything except um, next or step or continue, and then end is the other one. And the reason you can't use next, step, continue is because they modify where the current frame is, and it would be ambiguous if you, uh, you know, what, what are the next command would be actually, what, what it would mean uh, at that point. So an example of how this works is, um, if I'm working in my calculator program again, and I just wanna see um, what the stack looks like uh, as, as it processes the input, I can do this with a breakpoint commands. So the first thing I do is I actually set my breakpoint, and um, I know that line 21 is where it's, I've looked at the, looked at the source, and, um, I know that's where I wanna start looking at things. And then I tell it commands one. So that one is the breakpoint number that we got back from break. And you can see the prompt changes from PDB to com. And at this point now I'm entering commands that are gonna be executed when this breakpoint hits. So in this case I wanna do a couple things. I wanna pretty print the state, which is the stack. And I wanna pretty print what the, what the next value or operator coming in is and then I'm gonna continue. And as soon as I hit continue, uh, it drops me back to the PDB prompt, and I can continue again to actually start serving my program. So when I run this, what happens is I make a curl request, and it goes through a bunch of steps for me. It basically, it's gonna, continue, it's gonna hit this breakpoint three times in the process of processing one request, but it's never actually gonna stop executing because the last command I told it was continue. So this is an example where I've now effectively used a breakpoint, which normally stops execution, to simply give me a little bit of context about what's going on so that I can play with my program a little bit and understand it better um, and, and go back and look at it. There's also, a, you, know, it, you notice it does still say, uh, it does still point out pfcalc.py21 to tell me where it's breaking. There's also a silent command you can give it to completely suppress that so that all you see is this logged information. Um, I've used this um, a few times when been debugging something, in, in, again, inside of a framework or inside of Python, um, where I wanted just to know what was going on when I was hitting some code, but I didn't actually want to stop because um, either it was hit a whole lot and I just wanted to grab a bunch of state or, um, because I was doing a bunch of operations on, on that program. The um, customizations we talked about are interesting, but they require that you actually type in these commands, right? They, either you type in an alias or you type in these breakpoint commands. And PDB actually provides this PDBRC file. And um, this is actually what you want to create for yourself or for your team if you're gonna have these commands that you share to, to sort of tool PDB for your particular project or organization. This can be located in either your home directory or, or the current directory, and if they both exist, it's gonna execute the home version first and then the current directory. And these commands are, are basically entered exactly as if they were enter, entered at PDB's prompt. So you could imagine um, using this to define a bunch of aliases define breakpoints that you commonly use and then disable them so that they're there waiting, waiting for you when you drop into PDB and need them, um, and, and all that sort of thing. Uh, and you can also put comments in it so that it's uh, clear. It's pretty powerful, actually. This is an example I found um, that somebody smarter than me figured out, which is how to implement step watch. 
and next watch. And what this does is it adds two commands to PDB that basically say continue execution until this variable that I'm watching changes. Um, there's some really interesting stuff going on here, and for people who want to actually like sort of dive into PDBs, you know, the actual internals of it, the, the really interesting thing to me here is the command queue, CMD queue, because this is basically it's pushing more command into the queue um, as part of as part of executing an alias. Um, so there's a, the Stack Overflow link in the um, slides that you can go and read the entire discussion about it. But I thought it was pretty interesting that this is some behavior that's pretty nice to have inside of your debugger that you can very easily add to it with the PDBRC. PDB also, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, is extensible by other tools. Um, I'm not going to talk about these in depth, but I just want to mention that there's a bunch of tools that have been built on top of it. PDB over WebSockets, PDB um, in a sort of curses interface, there's an IPDB that adds tab completion. All of these are built on the same core, and if you're going to start using, you know, everything we talked about works in these tools as well, um, so these might be something you want to check out. If you're an Emacs user, and I hope you are, um, there's <laughs> Python mode includes something called PDB track, which is um, sort of the most amazing thing ever, where it will actually uh, follow you as you, if you run PDB inside of Emacs, and why wouldn't you, of course, um, it will open files as you hit them so that uh, you always have the full buffer right next to you. So PDB lets you explore your program. I hope I've convinced you about that. You can stop inside of code that you can't normally edit. And PDB is extensible. You can actually make it fit your particular needs um, and your particular project with some very simple commands. Um, and so I hope that uh, you can all walk away from here understanding that PDB is, uh, is a great tool to have in your tool bag. Thank you. I think we have a few minutes for questions. If um, anybody has them, there's a mic on either side. Thank you for the talk. Um, You're welcome. My, my question is uh, related to when you have a breakpoint into a, a loop, uh -huh. and uh, this loop is really fast, and every time you it continue, you go, you go back, and at some point, like, you know that you have a million iteration or a big number, right. and you want to quit. And you quit, and then you get back to the same point, and you quit again, and, <laughs> and then you look for the PID to kill it. Right. That's, um, there's a couple of different uh, commands we didn't talk about in depth that, um, that would be useful in that particular, particular case. There's a, re if you are done looking at that particular function and you just want to get out of it, there's a return command that will basically run until the current context um, returns. Um, and so that, that would, oh, if you have a, if you have a breakpoint set though, you have to, um, you could either, sorry, there's return, which will return from the current context, and there's until, which will run until a particular line is hit. But if you have a breakpoint set, then what you really need to do is um, disable it or tell it to ignore. So there was that slide with like four or five different breakpoint commands. If you know that it's going to have another 10,000 iterations, then you might say ignore two for if it's breakpoint two, 5,000, and it's going to then run 5,000 times, and then it'll break for you. So there's a couple of different options, kind of depending on how you set it up but return until and then ignore or disable are probably good ones to look at. Thanks. Uh, so when you're, when you're working on a project, uh, you did mention the PDBRC right. and set the, the breakpoints command there. Um, that is, I, I see it's desirable to set the, the breakpoints there, um, but is there a way to set the breakpoints in the source itself? maybe, and only trigger them if a certain flag is called. I, I, I saw that you can import PDB, so I'm guessing that you right. can do that. Um, uh, and my second question follow-up to that uh -huh. is, um, would you use uh, PDB to test uh, an, an, an instance on a staging server and maybe pipe the results of the, of the calls to, I don't know, syslog or whatever? So with respect to your first question about 
Um, I'm, I'm going to ask you a clarifying question about the second one, so maybe stay there. Uh, <laughs> with respect to the first question about um, about, about specifying the breakpoint inside of the source and only triggering it in certain conditions, at that point, it's really no different than using set trace. So something that you might do is, you know, if some flag is true, then PDB dot set trace, and the set trace is when it's going to actually drop into into PDB. Yeah, I was mostly uh, interested in, uh, for example, I want to run my program, and I'm only interested in the postmortem. So it's like, okay, run this. Oh, do I have to go in and type continue? I see. Um, you don't have to. So. Um, you could, so basically you just need to use the post-mortem call at a, top level, at a top level exception handler. So you can imagine writing Django middleware, for example, that has an has a, has a exception handler on it that imports PDB and calls pdb.postmortem um, with the exception information from, from sys.git last exe. Um, you could imagine, that, I mean, the SOAP, years ago had a post-mortem debugging mode as well that basically did the same thing. So all you need to really do at that point is have a top-level exception handler, and then you won't have to, and that calls pdb.postmortem, and then you won't have to um, type continue when you run your program. With respect to your second question around um, running this on staging and piping it to syslog, I'm not totally sure. I mean, PDB is really an interactive tool. You could conceivably, um, you could conceivably have a breakpoint that has some commands that printed something out. Um, I'm not sure how useful that actually is. They're going to go, they're going to go to standard error. So if you can redirect standard error, that's okay. sort of the thing cool. that's going to happen. That, that's okay, great. What I wanted to know. Thank you. Thanks for the talk. I don't really have a question, but um, I did want to point out that if you're an IPython user, you can use dash dash PDB. And uh, if you get an exception in IPython, it'll drop you right into it. Cool. So is that if, is that if you're using the IPython? Um, interpreter and you just do dash dash PDB, it'll drop into PDB. Exactly, and that applies to the notebook as well. Oh, cool. Great to know. Thanks. Uh, one of the really nice features of GDB is being able to attach to a program and start debugging it when it's already run. Was one of those uh, remote ones can do something like that? So um, RDB sort of does that. We've used RDB before to... Um, Basically, listen on, have another process that listens on a socket, and then let you attach to something, or another, have another thread that listens on a socket to let you attach that way. There, there's actually a project that was on uh, I came across a couple weeks ago called Pyringe that um, does GDB style attachment. So it's P Y R I N G E. Um, I didn't include it here because it doesn't actually use PDB. It uses its own sort of uh, command syntax. But that might be something that you want to look at as well. I have another compared to GDB question. Um, is there a way to get like a display, like in GDB, such that I can see the results of an expression or variables as I step through code? Um, so the question is around whether you can see, have a display that shows the result of an expression as, the, as it's happening, right? Sort of like display in GDB. Right. Um, the closest I've been able to get is basically using breakpoint commands with continue. So it's, it, there, um, I think PUDB, is this curses version? Yeah, that's uh, I it, that. It's really great. Yeah, and then that that has this sort of um, display you're talking about. But for sort of stock PDB, um, there's not really a place to show that, or you know where that might be outputted. Um, I saw one time a debugger that um, supported an undo statement. And, oh, interesting. Um, so you step through your program. Oh, damn! I stepped too far. Um, it didn't have post post mortem, which is what I think I would. Do, but right. and it worked just by recording the entire session, all the commands you've entered, uh -huh. and then um, when you undo, it would start the program again and replay all those commands, which works like enough times to be useful. Have you, <laughs> um, I, I, I guess I haven't dug through the help enough. But like, is there a, is there a way to? Do you think there's a quick way to hack that into into PDB? I don't think there's a quick way to hack it in, but it would be pretty interesting to try. Um, if you just wanted to record the commands and then play them back, you, you would probably be able to do that simply by subclassing PDB. But it's going to be pretty limited in terms of the, the cases where that is actually going to work. Because if you had any other interaction with the program, you're going to have to, re, you're going to, have to manually do that interaction as well. So um, 
it's a, that's a cool idea. I'm not sure how you, how you go about it most easily. All right, I'd like to thank Nathan for a fantastic talk and let everybody know there's a break downstairs. Thank you very much.